Hey guys, hey ladies, hey friends, hey foes. We just wanted to take a second to remind you that while we're okay swearing when little ears are listening, you might not be, and that's okay. So here's your chance to pause us and wait for nap time, or pop in your earbuds. We hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Done Playing by the Rules. We have a guest today, but we'll start off with my name is Janelle. And I'm Jenna. And our guest today is a friend who you may or may not have heard us reference on the show before. Her name is Jacqueline, and we'll let her introduce herself, and then we'll tell you a little bit about how we met and why we thought it was really important for Jacqueline to come on and talk with us today. Hi. Hi. Okay, Hi. so Jacqueline, Jenna, Janelle. Let's see oh how gosh. confused we can make everyone. But Janelle and Jenna, your regular host, Jacqueline, your guest host, and Jacqueline is here because Jacqueline, Jenna, and I all had sons in the same junior kindergarten class. We all were friends. We all met. We all hung out for the first time together, all three of us, I think, right? And yeah. we did a lot of play dates together. And then COVID happened. All of our kids went everywhere. But we all kind of kept in touch. And recently, Jacqueline started a what do you call what's the wording? I don't want to ever speak incorrectly in the wording a battle with breast cancer. Sure. Battle. Is that yes, how do you like to what do you like to say it? I don't know that I have a, a specific word. Journey. Okay. Journey. Journey. Yeah. Okay. Some I I want it to be as positive as you feel about it, or as negative if you're if you're having an angry day. We can call it something meaner. And as you guys know, Jenna's mom struggled and battled breast cancer. And Jacqueline is young. Jacqueline is in good shape. Jacqueline is healthy. Under forty. No family history. Diagnosed with breast cancer. And so we thought it would be a complete disservice to not see if Jacqueline was willing to come on because we are all in this same. Age age bracket. Jacqueline has two young kids. We all need to be aware of the risks, even without a family history. And so um, I'm going to let Jenna and Jacqueline talk a little bit more because they're more familiar with this. But I was very curious because I have a lot of family history with breast cancer. And I get yearly mammograms, but that's it. And I've discussed genetic counseling and genetic testing, and I've gotten a, met with a lot of roadblocks and red tape. And so I kind of thought we should cover as many of these topics as we can in our little allotted time today. Jacqueline, if you just kind of want to share, like, did you go to the doctor because something wasn't right? Or was this a checkup? I think that would be like a great place to kind of dive in it. Okay. Um, it's kind of a longish story because I got information like piecemeal at me whenever I've talked for way too long. So I do self-exam for no other reason than my doctor told me to and I'm a rule follower. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I do. And in October, I noticed there was a lump and I don't do them all the time. Like you're supposed to do them like every month. And I don't yep. know, I do it whenever it like, comes up into my head and I'm in the shower. It, it was like, it felt like a golf ball, like inside. Oh, wow. Okay. It was intense. I was like, how did I, how did I miss the like lead up to golf ball? You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so of course I'm like, David, come here, like feel this. What is this? And he was like, uh, it's yeah, let's, that's definitely something like you should go mm. call. Who do you call? And so I was like, I don't know who you call. So I called my OB and she was like, well, it's time for your yearly anyway, come in and we'll take a look at you. And so she did. And she was like, you don't have any history of breast cancer. You're young, you're healthy. I'm not worried about this. This is probably dense breast tissue. But if you're anxious, why not I just order you a mammogram so that you can like sleep at night? And I was like, okay, that would be great. So I'm waiting for my mammogram. She scheduled it kind of out. Like it was like a month out or something like that at the OB practice. And then while I'm waiting for this mammogram, I'm feeling it again at home. And then it's like a Japanese horror movie. I don't know, not Japanese. <laughs> a really bad horror movie. And blood starts coming out of my nipple when I'm feeling oh it. Oh my God. It was terrifying. And so, of course, what do you do when this happens? You Google. And Google mm -hmm. was like, you probably have breast cancer, or it could be, I forget this other thing that's like something with your milk stuff. So I called my OB the next day and I was like, horror scene happened yesterday. What do I do? And she was like, I'm not going to lie to you. That's not good. So I'm going to change. You're going to go to a breast specialist now and not do the mammogram here, but like go to Virginia Breast Center. Mm -hmm. And then um, she set me up with like this amazing specialist who everybody says 
like, oh, you have him, like, he's the best. Um, and he was so kind and wonderful. And when I got the, it, it went like much faster. Like I was supposed to get a mammogram like a month out and it ended up being like the next week. He had me do all these tests. I did a mammogram for the first time. And because I'm, I was 35 at the time, your breast tissue is really dense when you're younger, which is mm-hmm. one of the reasons why they don't have you do it until you're over 40 is because mammograms are sort of as guests as maybe Janelle's had this experience, like sort of inconclusive in a lot of ways. Like there's not much yeah. you can see because the tissue is so dense. Yeah. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go, <laughs> but. No, but also you have small, you and I both are small chested and those are often inconclusive as well. So you should still go, but a lot of times they don't, you're going to go get mm-hmm. the ultrasound also. Yeah. And that's what I did. So I got the mammogram and they were like, there's stuff, but you can't really see much that we don't know. So I immediately went like just around across the hall to the ultrasound place. And the woman there did the ultrasound and she had me on that chair forever. And she was mm-hmm. like, oh, nothing is screaming cancer, but I can't definitively rule anything out she's like I see this lump I see what you're talking about but I can't really tell what it is but everybody was trying to like make it sound really like no big deal everybody's like mm-hmm. it's probably I mean what are the odds probably nothing everybody's being really sweet about it and I was like starting to calm down and then I just went right back to my breast specialist like this was like this whirlwind I was there for like six hours and then the breast specialist is like look we don't know you're clearly freaked out I would be more comfortable doing a biopsy so that way we know what the heck so we did the biopsy and that is how I got diagnosed with breast cancer. So there was like a week maybe in between the biopsy and the callback. Okay. And that week was really hard because mm-hmm. he did not seem so cavalier about it. I think he had kind of, he wasn't as quick to be like, it's probably nothing like everybody else was. Yeah. So when I got the call back, I, um, he told me it was DCIS and I would say it wrong because I've heard everybody say it differently, but it's like ductal, I forget, mm-hmm. basically breast cancer in your milk duct and in situ in situ means that it's non-invasive so it should just stay where it is good okay so he said that's technically stage zero he's like so don't freak out we need to definitely have surgery and take this out but we need you to get an mri first and see exactly how extensive this is like where it all is so i'm trying not to freak out but the stage zero made me like calm down because the week leading up to like that in between the biopsy and the call I was like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, what if my kids have to grow up without a mom? You know, oh. like, because he was not cavalier about it at all. And he was the specialist, you know? And so I'm like, yeah, trying to make peace with like, prepare myself mentally, emotionally. Like, and I know so many women who have had biopsies who kind of do the same thing. It's hard not to mm-hmm. go to worst case scenario because yeah. you're a mom. That's what moms do. Yeah. Totally. And that's your whole job is to like prepare, you know? <laughs> And I'm like trying to like think like, okay, what do I do? Like, you know, I'm trying to come to peace with things. I'm like, okay, I've like lived a good life. <laughs> you know, like, like, things are going through your head, you know? Mm-hmm. And my husband was like, you are way, not, he was supportive, but he was trying to like calm me down. Like, we don't know anything yet. There's no reason to freak out yet. So anyway, um, we get the MRI. We find out that it's CIS grade three, which is uh, the most aggressive kind. And it's like completely covered the entire breast. Like there's definitely no chance of just getting a lumpectomy. A lumpectomy. You have to get just a full mastectomy for sure. There's nothing on the right breast, so it's up to me if I want to do a double or a single mastectomy. And everybody encouraged me to get a double. They were like, "You're so young. Like, why would you just like walk around with that specter hanging over you? Like, what if it happens?" Yes. So and for like you know, symmetry. <laughs> <laughs> with that, did um, your did your doctor let you decide if you wanted a single or a double? And I'm just asking because when my mom had it done, it was probably early nineties, maybe late eighties. And they were like, no, you, they didn't even want to do a mastectomy. They wanted to do a lumpectomy. And she was like, you're taking the whole thing off. And she wanted both of them done. And they refused. I've heard people even say this to me who just had cancer like five years ago. Apparently a lot Mm -hmm. has shifted as it does. Everybody was encouraging me because I was very young um, and because it was so aggressive. um, Just go ahead and get everything taken out like whenever I would they would leave it up to me and then I would say I'm doing a double they were like oh okay. thank you good answer <laughs> yeah. and I'm sorry your mom had to deal with that That's, I, I so many yeah. women have told me that and one more question while we're still talking about the actual lump where exactly was yours because I think that's really important because my mom's personally was in near her armpit and so breast cancer didn't really cross their minds right away because it felt more like you know when you've used like deodorant it kind of clogs the pore that's kind of more what hers felt like. And it was like pea size. So it was small, but you made a great point on the size. Isn't always the issue. A lot of times it's 
the type of cancer and how aggressive it is. So where exactly was yours on your breast? Sounds like a similar spot, like, right. I mean, right there, like armpit okay. area. I think that's a really good point too, which I forget about. And then Jenna will tell us her next question, but I haven't had a refresher on a self-exam for a while. And I know that my self-exams are centered around the nipple and I don't go any further out than a few inches from my nipple. So that's a good reminder to all of us listening that you are going basically like shoulder down. Like, And I haven't had a breast exam at the doctor because I just go for mammograms. So in a over a year. And so that's a good reminder when you're doing your monthly check to go all the way out. Don't mm-hmm. just stop at, around the nipple like I would. Yeah. Um, so I got an MRI and oh yeah, MRI. found out we needed a mastectomy. I was going to get a double. So we scheduled that. This was in December. I got that call and I had the MRI in December and we scheduled the, it was actually, we knew from the beginning, once I decided I was going to get a mastectomy, we knew that was actually three surgeries. So the first surgery was a sentinel node biopsy, which is um, they go in and they take lymph nodes that your like breast tissue kind of feeds into, um, and they take those to biopsy them to see if the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. Because okay. if it was going to go anywhere, that would be the first place it would go. Okay. Theoretically, mine should not have been in the lymph nodes because it was DCIS. But DCIS, if left untreated, morphs into cancer, as all cancer does, like can spread anywhere so I might have that might not be true that all cancer does that but it seems like from what I've learned a lot of cancers do like even ones that are like this is non-invasive it can become invasive if it's left yeah alone. yeah if left on yeah unchecked so um they took four lymph nodes and we found two of them had no cancer and two of them had very 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 small amounts of cancer so my breast surgeon at the time was like I'm not worried about this I think we can pretty confidently avoid chemo and radiation we'll do surgery we'll be fine and so if the margins are clear after the mastectomies then I would feel comfortable with you like being done with treatment and so we were all excited and yay and then we had the mastectomy and it went direct to implant which was awesome that I could do that mm-hmm. and we kind of thought we were done And then my breast surgeon brought my case to a breast conference where there's a bunch of like specialists in conference talking about the cases that are difficult for them, but that they want like second opinions on. And he got a lot of feedback from people saying she should absolutely get chemo because she's young and it somehow got in those lymph nodes. Like even if it was a small amount, like Mm -hmm. how did it get there? Clearly it started morphing into something else. It was grade three. It was all over that breast. Like she would be foolish to not even consider it. So he called me actually on my birthday and said, like, I think actually I'm rethinking this chemo thing. And we had thought we were pretty much done other than like Mm -hmm. a little surgery later. So that was a real bummer. And uh, (laughs) he made appointments with me for me to go see two oncologists, one who said that I should get it and one who was supposed to say that I she didn't think I needed it. And then we went to go ahead and made an appointment with another one. So we saw three oncologists and it ended up being that all three oncologists suggested the same thing, like you should get chemo. Mm -hmm. Um, So it ended up, the plan changed and I did four rounds of PC, which is known as chemo light. (laughs) Um, It's still hard, um, but I can only imagine how much harder it is when you are, there's all different kinds of chemo drugs. So this is the least difficult one to do, I guess. Um, and I only had to do four rounds of it, which is the least amount that you could do. Um, and then that wrapped up. So I did that from March to May. And then I just had my last surgery last week. And now I think I'm in the process of being sort of done other than follow up, hopefully. All right. And I what- have two questions before Jenna interrupts me. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to ask what the sur- last surgery was, aren't you? I was. I was going to okay, ask you, that, you had that's, nipple that's reconstruction. One of my the last surgery, um, so the mastectomy was direct to implant, but what that meant was it was just skin and implant, that's it, which looks fine if you have a shirt on, but like bathing suits and kind of in general, it's not, it's just not very attractive. To be honest, like specifically, the skin has like a rippling effect, which means- Yeah, it gets crepey. No fat in there. So yeah. it just kind of like, it looks like skin with stuff in it. It's not cute. Yeah. And because I breastfed, uh, there was just more skin than breast tissue. So when they did the, the implant, she basically was gross even hearing it, but she was like, well, I just took the breast tissue, like put it on a scale. Like that's how much it is. That's how big your implant <laughs> was. But you know, my skin was bigger than that because I had breastfed. Yeah. So she was, my plastic surgeon was like, look, if we're going to do the fat grafting anyway, like let's just do a lift and let's get some, rid of some of that skin because that's going to help a lot with how mm-hmm. it looks. She was like, that's the only perk of having cancer at 30. 
five <laughs> is that you get like a insurance paid breast lift. You know? and I was yeah. like, mm. So just what the surgery was. So I'm right now, I'm a week out. I'm wearing this like compression. It's basically like lipo. Like they take fat out of my stomach and my pub handles on the back and put it in my breast so that it looks more mm-hmm. real. Oh, I suppose I, I don't even think about that because they take, they essentially and this is going to sound like a weird way but they must i never even thought about the fact that they have to scoop out almost everything inside of your skin Mm -hmm. like there's nothing there nothing oh my god yeah so it's literally just like a plastic this sounds so but it's a plastic bag with nothing in it and then you just drop like a water balloon in it and Mm -hmm. you're like that's your breast now oh my god i never even thought about the full removal of everything so it's just skin yeah that would be that must also be uncomfortable to have like nothing (laughs) It's a weird, it's like the whole thing has been so bizarre. I Okay, so it, my other question is, sorry, before we get too far away from it, someone who has very little experience, can you, Jenna or Jacqueline, tell us in a few sentences, what exactly is chemo? Someone that doesn't know this just knows the word chemo and knows there's some chemicals or radiation. That's my full extent of chemo. And so I was going to look into it before we recorded. And I was like, I'm just going to ask them because I feel like a lot of women that don't have experience with this are supporting our friends in chemo. I've gone to my girlfriends who have battled breast cancer's final chemo appointments, and I still don't fully understand what it is. So could one of you talk on what chemo is actually? Yeah, go for it. I'll let you do that one. Um. Well, so... I'm afraid I'm not the expert either. <laughs> well, what it, was your chemo experience? My understanding is it's drugs that are targeted to kill cells that replicate quickly, which is okay. why you lose hair and why burn easily in the sun and stuff like that. Because there are a lot and why people get like mouth sores and things like that, because any cells that replicate quickly with like hair or skin are the ones who die. And then in a perfect world, the cancer all dies too, because that is something that replicates quickly. And then all of the stuff that's supposed to be in your body has the power to like, in theory, regenerate itself once the chemo stops. Mm -hmm. So in theory, all of those cells that we were killing off before, the cancer is now gone. And then all of those cells start producing healthy cells again once you're done. So is that why people are uh, considered immunocompromised while they're going through chemo? Because you can't. White, yeah, white blood cells okay. are another one of those that. I had no quickly. idea about any of that. That is very interesting. Yeah. And I know you kind of mentioned about radiation and that's a completely separate thing. Some people do chemo and radiation. Okay. Some people just do chemo and some people just do radiation. And radiation is more, I believe, like a laser type treatment to actually like kill, break up the tumors, the cells. Um, mm-hmm. It's a completely different process. So the reason I got chemo is because the concern, um, I kind of glossed over this before, but the concern from the oncologist's perspective was if this cancer comes back as a distant recurrence, meaning not in the breast, not local, so like in your brain or your bones or whatever, that's an automatic stage four situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it was to help like in a, forget the word they use, but like your whole body, like it covers in theory, cancer, no matter where it has spread, it can attack that and radiation is for more localized like Mm -hmm. exactly how you want to describe it like for shooting lasers basically at oh that's really interesting so it provides you kind of a barrier situation and removes any so the chemo would hypothetically sort of kill down anything that's already started to kind of manifest inside of your body Mm -hmm. right I'm learning so much. (laughs) And with your surgery, were you able to keep your nipples or did you have to have nipple reconstruction as well? I lost one. um, And I haven't had any kind of reconstruction. So super cute. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So that first surgery, actually, when they did the lymph node biopsy on one side, they did a nipple sparing surgery on the other side. Um, And for anybody who's listening, uh, Angelina Jolie made this kind of like it's not popular but like she did it and it became like more well known basically what they do is I think it's interesting but a concern when you're doing a mastectomy is that like the blood won't flow to the nipple and like Mm -hmm. the skin there could die so they like cut an incision underneath your breast to kind of get your blood vessels to start making new patterns and pathways to go like to your skin further away and that worked for for me it's kind of a newish thing like in the last decade or so people have started doing that and so you lost the one nipple because there was cancer in it exactly because it was like in the milk ducts and so Mm -hmm. it like went they were like no deal yeah right right through there okay um you can get 
tattoos, like 3D tattoos that I'm mm -hmm. considering. Yeah. You can also get reconstruction. My personally, my plastic surgeon was like trying to lead me towards the tattoo route as opposed to that. Um, mm -hmm. he, was, he was like, why do you want another surgery? Like just another chance for infection. Like you could mm -hmm. just get a tattoo. And like the sensation is significantly less there now after the mastectomy. I will say, I mean, my mom had nipple reconstruction surgery way back when. So advances are a lot different. But then she had to have everything redone and she decided to do the tattoo and it looked so much better than the nipple reconstruction. You couldn't even tell. And then she was like, I'm also a badass because I have a tattoo, like even though no one saw it, but <laughs> so cool. <laughs> We've mentioned that Jacqueline has two young kids. They are six and four, correct? Six and three, but they both have birthdays in a couple of weeks. So they're almost, okay. seven, almost four. And just to preface that she has the largest three-year-old I've ever seen. And he is so sweet. <laughs> so I always think he's so much older than my three-year-old. He wears like size eight shirt. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, there's no way he's not wearing bigger clothes than my seven-year-old. Yes. <laughs> yes. So with kids that young, did you tell them right away? And do you think they understood exactly what was going on? Or what do you think their grasp on reality was? So we told them once we knew that we were going to have surgery, because that's going to impact them. I don't know if I would have mm -hmm. told them if I felt like there wasn't going to be any impact, but the way that my story went, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we did. And I, like all other big things, like when I told them, you know, my grandmother died or I told them whatever, like all my big discussions, I freaked out about it. And they were like, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah. All right. Sure. Um, but we basically sat them down and we were like, mommy um, is going to have surgery because and I explained what surgery is it's like when the doctor you know mommy has to like go totally to sleep and I can't feel anything and the doctor is going to use a, a knife and like cut a part of my body out because there is cancer in it and if we don't cut it out then the cancer is going to make mom would make mommy really sick mm -hmm. so we have to get that out so Nana's going to come for a couple weeks and she's going to be helping take care of you and mommy's going to be spending a lot of time upstairs feeling better getting better I tried to make it not a big deal I asked Jenna's advice on this because I know she has experience um with her mom having kids you were three also were you not when you're yeah mom it was like was two that? three yeah so I was like I know someone who has experience that's like please tell me what to do like how do I talk oh, to my wow kids? yeah so, I didn't even think about that yeah and so she was great and her advice to me was like be very honest with them which um for people who have heard your like your kids lying podcast episode or whatever <laughs> it's very like that matters to her a lot and so she was like the big thing or I don't want to speak for you, but you mentioned mm -hmm. that like, had it been done differently and had you been kind of told more explicitly what was going on, you think you would have responded better mm -hmm. long-term. Yeah, definitely. I think the fact that you said like, mommy's getting better. Like my whole thing was that I felt as a kid separated from my mom. I didn't know why, and I couldn't get to her. So basically it's like either mom was in the hospital or mom was in her room healing and I wasn't allowed to see her. And as a two and three-year-old, I didn't understand why or what I was doing wrong. And my grandma also stayed with us and she would find me like sleeping under chairs, like looking for my mom at night. And no one thought to sit me down and be like, sorry, this, no one's thought to like sit me down and be like, this is why you can't see mom and she's going to be okay. And I mm -hmm. think I needed that security because I knew something was wrong as a kid, but I didn't know what, and clearly as an adult, it still impacts me. And that's why I'm very honest with my kids because in my world, my mom is not there. Other people are coming in and out of my house for chemo. I had to go and go to other people's houses, which was fine. And I'm glad my mom had that support, but I didn't know it was wrong. And I just remember my mom was like throwing up and I didn't know why. And to me, it's scary. Um, and so I felt honored that Jacqueline reached out to me because <laughs> I think everyone needs you know, as a little kid, you don't know what's going on. And it's been something I've struggled with into my thirties and I'm still in <laughs> therapy over it's, it's the reason I have issues with germs because as a kid, I just knew mom's throwing up and there's scary things going on and she's not available. And that's about all my little brain knew my brother, I think could understand it a little more. And then I do remember like once my mom came home and had, you know, was back on her feet and stuff, she had like wigs and all of that was fun. And then I would go to the hospital with her to talk to people who had cancer, but I still, as a kid, didn't really understand what was going on. And so I think that's a great way you put it. Like you didn't give them 
more information than was needed, but you let them know like mommy's healing and this is what's going on. And so I'm really proud of you for doing that. Literally just did what you told me to. (laughs) (laughs) Jenna's instruction manual. But that is a hard thing. And that's what, when Jenna was talking about how big your youngest child is, um, I was thinking to myself like, oh my gosh, because he, I know how much Mikey, who is a year older than your youngest, needs to be held and picked up and carried and loved on. And that's what Jenna also would have needed at that time. And then to, and you're kind of the same kind of mom Jenna and I are, are where you're Mm -hmm. like, how many hours do you want to snuggle on the couch? I am here for it. And so our kids are very, some may call them clingy. I I prefer to call them (laughs) snuggly. Um, And the first thing I thought when Jenna said, I was like, oh my God her youngest is so big, he would have still needed her to pick him up and carry him and love on him because he's the same type of kid as all of our kids. And then for that, for Jenna to just be cut off from that, I can't imagine what that would feel like thinking of even Jacqueline's youngest son. And so you being able to tell them I'm upstairs getting better. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm still here. I'm upstairs getting better. This person's going to come help mommy get better, but not burdening them with more than they can handle was a beautifully done execution. Yeah. Even if it, it was really all was. Jenna's idea, you still executed no. <laughs> it beautifully. Yeah. So that was cleansing breath. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of your precious boys, has the doctor mentioned, and to preface, I know a lot of people think of breast cancer as a woman's disease. However, it can impact males. So since you were young and everything, has your doctor talked to you about any kind of genetic testing or does he think this was just kind of like a fluke type thing? No, we did genetic testing almost immediately as soon as I got the diagnosis. Um, oh, good. And I did not test positive for the RICA BRCA gene, mm-hmm. which in some ways was like a relief for everybody else. I mm-hmm. felt like, okay, well, that means that like, just because I have this does not mean, you know, all of my family members are potentially more at risk. Yeah. But um, it did also feel like, well, then what the heck is going on? Like, why? Mm -hmm. And, but then I found out, this is something I, I I had an experience. So after I got diagnosed and I put it out on Facebook as just the like, Hey guys, this is what's going on in my world. Um, I found out after that, that I did have some people in my family, extended family who had breast cancer, but never told anybody about it. Like they kept it to themselves, which is their priority. Yeah. But also been nice to have known as a family member. I just kept thinking like, if I had known, maybe I would have been like more uh, intentional with my self exams and maybe would have caught this sooner and maybe could have avoided Mm -hmm. chemo, you know, and they were like third cousin, a great aunt. It was nobody like immediate, but it's kind of like, if you know, that friend that gets pregnant with twins and they get to know a ran in the family and then like, Oh yeah, this person and this person, mm-hmm. they all had twins. <laughs> like, it was like, that. It was like people were coming at me like, Oh, you didn't know you're no, nobody it's said. It's such a private. bummer. Yeah. And Jenna and I also had a conversation regarding that because I was like, I want to get the genetic testing done. And Jenna was like, that's not how it works. Like your grandma or anyone living, the person that had the cancer, has to get the testing done like and I didn't know how any of this worked and so that is something that if you are keeping your diagnosis to yourself that is your prerogative however just know that there could be someone else in the family that's young with young children that could benefit from the information at the family Mm -hmm. barbecue this summer (laughs) right um going back to chemo so you said you had four treatments correct okay And how soon did you start that after surgery slash diagnosis, as well as did you have any reactions? And third, could you include in there the awesomeness of this cold cap, which was learning for me and I think really cool. We had to start chemo pretty quickly after surgery. Um, So the ideal time is six weeks after. And I think because we didn't even start talking about chemo until I had already been done with surgery for three or four weeks, I didn't start chemo until seven weeks after, which even that one week, people were like, seriously, like if we're going to do it, we have to start now. Otherwise mm-hmm. the efficacy goes down. Um, so I had surgery on January 20th and then I started chemo in March, I would say, but early March, like seven. So I'm sorry. I lost all your questions. No, you're so good. And did you start- have... Did you have any reactions from the chemo? So, yes. I, what did I do? I had, so the first one, I experienced what people talk about, like their taste really changes. And for me, it wasn't that things started tasting bad. 
well, a little bit of that, but it was mostly like losing my sense of taste mostly. It was very bizarre. I know people who have had COVID have described yeah. it. Uh, it's just so bizarre. You're like very aware of texture and not aware of taste. Like you eat something with olive oil on it and you can feel the olive oil in your mouth, but you like <laughs> you can't taste it. Oh, very weird. weird. But I learned through, I'm part of a support group on Facebook and People were like, you have to chew ice while the chemo is going into your body. Like, chew it constantly, like, the whole time. Like, keep chewing it, like, so that your mouth is totally numb. Um, and that really, really, really did help. And so I lost wow. some sense of taste, but I could still taste some stuff. I don't know. Like, I still don't really taste salt super well. And, like, vinegar tasted very acidic in a way that, like, battery acid to me, like, the whole time. But huh. it was a lot better than a lot of people have told me. Like, they just... When stuff tastes bad, that's even worse because when it, you can't taste it at all, you can be like, well, I'm hungry, I'll eat. But when mm-hmm. stuff tastes bad, it's like you can't even really convince yourself to eat. So there was mm-hmm. that. I gained a lot of weight because I was on steroids and chemo makes you gain weight. And it's a thing they don't talk about. I kind of thought I was going to lose mm-hmm. weight on chemo, but it seems now that pretty much everyone's got the nausea thing relatively under control for the most part. I don't want to say for everybody, but um, it's more like you're on steroids and mm-hmm. you're the only thing that really tastes good is like rice and toast and stuff like that. You're, yeah. carbs. you're not moving around a lot. So I, I gained at least 20 pounds. I stopped weighing myself essentially, um, yeah. which I'm kind of a small person. So that was many sizes up for me. Um, mm-hmm. Like my yoga pants weren't fitting anymore. <laughs> um and which is fine but and that is surprising so because you do kind of associate chemo with weight loss and the loss of you know all and so that is a surprising yeah. that most people I was very know. surprised nobody told me either like yeah. and then I would say something like I was at my plastic surgeon at a follow-up and I was like yeah I've put on a lot of weight and she goes yeah it's chemo's dirty little secret people don't tell you mm-hmm. like but that's the way it is now because Thank God, I would rather put on weight than be nauseous. Those are yeah. my two options. Ugh, nausea. Um, so there was that. There was the general blah feeling, which it doesn't really encapsulate it. But mm-hmm. the real, I still am having trouble thinking, honestly, just thinking. Um, but when I was going through it, I would have a hard time thinking thoughts. I don't know how mm-hmm. to say it differently. But they call it chemo brain or chemo fog. But it would yeah. be like, I would, it wasn't that I would, I had trouble speaking my thoughts too, but like I couldn't even think them in my head. It was, it's just very, I still mm. am having trouble doing like really basic things that I, um, like really simple math things sometimes. I'm just sitting there, like, I don't even, like, I know to, I'm supposed to add those numbers and I'm looking at them like my brain's just not doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That sounds really um, scary. Mm-hmm. Weird. And it hasn't affected me in any big ways yet, you know? I mean, fortunately, I'm not like a rocket scientist or something. <laughs> <Like I'm> a- <laughs> <laughs> so but, I, like, I mean you have to be able to add a couple numbers together here and there with your children and like just to, I always like my one of my bigger fears is the fear of like not making it's that like locked in syndrome almost where you can like think something but you can't force it to happen and that to me I've never heard of that as a side effect and that is very terrifying mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say like, because I only had four treatments and it was like chemo light, I'm sure people who have had more intense treatments just have a totally different yes. result. But I just, it's sort of like what people say, like, like pregnancy brain, where you like forget stuff, but it's, it's not that because it's different in that you really are trying to think of it and you just can't. Mm-hmm. Like reading was really hard for me and I'm a big reader. Yeah. I had to just, I could only reread. Or even watching a TV show, like even a comedy, like I couldn't follow a plot. Like I would just be like, what's going on? Just totally confused. Mm-hmm. So I've done a lot of rereading and rewatching of things the last few months. <laughs> Definitely. I know my mom said that was a, a big one. The, she called it chemo fog. And she always joked because she was like, my kids are young, similar to you. And she was like, so I have like mom brain plus chemo fog. So I'm just really screwed. Like, <laughs> I mean, she just took it as like a joke eventually because she was like, I just have to kind of roll with it. And it did get better. Yeah. But yeah, she definitely said she was on a lot more intensive treatments for her ovarian cancer. And she was like the brain fog. I mean, I could even tell just talking to her. It's kind of like, mom, are you okay? Like, seriously, like, she just couldn't get the words out, couldn't think right. And she said the same thing. Like, it's not something you can really describe. And you okay, didn't Jenna wants lose to hear your about hair. The cold cap. The cold cap. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I, so the cold cap is, <laughs> so if you can imagine sort of like the hat that, uh, or a hat, hat, I'm an athlete, um, the cap <laughs> that swimmers wear. Um, <laughs> so like, it's very similar to that, like a swimmer's cap, but it was filled with, gel 
um, and they would plug this cap into a machine and the gel would immediately freeze. And it was, I don't, I'm probably going to say the wrong number, but it was definitely negative below zero degrees on my head. And the thought process, the same thing with like the taste buds, is if we make it very cold on the scalp, it will help keep the chemo away because it'll restrict the blood vessels right there. And so the chemo will literally have a hard time getting into like those little vessels, blood vessels right by your head, and it'll help you keep your hair. And everybody has totally different results, but the chemo regimen I was on, the four rounds of TC, it's almost like if anyone was going to do a cold cap, these are the people who should do it because you have the best chance of good results. So uh, you had to put it on 30 minutes before your chemo started. And then the chemo, like while it's going into you, it's on the whole time. And then it's on for another 90 minutes after your chemo is over. So I was in that chair all day for chemo, which some people go in and out like in a few hours, but like chemo days where I got there at nine and left at five. And then you can take it off like 10 minutes later, but after your head literally thaws, because if you pull it off too soon, like all of your hair is frozen to the cap. So oh but gosh. there would be like ice crystals in my hair. It was very hard. The pressure was unbearable I mean I bared it <laughs> I bore it but it was like <laughs> it, was, it was like I couldn't think about anything other than just my head is mm. it's just tight the cold I got used to it after like 30 minutes but the pressure because it has to be really really tight it was just like crushing my skull with like ice for five hours it was very oh hard so that, and that vein that I want to do <laughs> yeah so did you lose like eyebrows eyelashes yeah, I just started getting eyebrows back last week. Um, okay. My eyelashes actually left like six weeks after chemo. All my eyelashes fell out, which I thought I had mm. kind of dodged up a little bit. Um, yeah. But the cold cap doesn't help with your eyebrows or your eyelashes. Right. And I lost, I would say, 85% of my hair. I had a lot to begin with. I think it actually, if somebody had thinner hair, they would have better results with the chemo because my hair was so thick that um, it kind of kept the, the cap away from my mm-hmm. skull more. I have lost a lot. I am almost completely, I, like, almost have no hair on, like, the crown of my head. I'm just starting to grow back in now. And you guys can kind of see I have, like, mm-hmm. right here where, like, this is where the cap went. Yeah. And then this is, like, baby hairs right here. Aww. So I'm just starting to get some hair back. But it was enough that I could throw it up in a headband and a messy mm-hmm. bun and it wouldn't know that I was going to. Yeah. I would recommend it if you're – I did it mostly because I didn't want to freak out my kids. Mm-hmm. But – the thing is, you just have to go in it with an open mind that like this might not work because yeah. for a lot of women, it doesn't work. And everybody has mixed results. I've, I'm part of a Facebook group that's just for this cold cap, like people who are cold capping. And um, people often lose like 50% or more of their hair, but you just don't realize how much hair you have that you can mm-hmm. still um, throw it up in a ponytail and yeah. make it work. But the shedding, I'm still shedding uh, nine weeks post chemo. They say it lasts for about 10 weeks or so. And is that something your doctor provided, the cold cap, or did you have to provide the machine, the cap, everything? Doctor provided the machine that I plugged into. The running infusion center provided it. I had okay. to order a cap, which they kind of did for me, but it's expensive, which is mm-hmm. another deterrent from people doing it. Um, and a lot of insurances don't cover it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you pay per session. So the more chemo treatments you have. So some people have to get weekly mm-hmm. chemo. So if you were doing it that way, I can only imagine how exorbitant that would be. Um, yeah. So you never had to wear a wig or anything? I didn't wear one. I probably could have at one point, but I was like not really going anywhere because yeah, you no know, in COVID and stuff. And I was like, I'm fine just throwing my hair up at a ponytail and calling it. Yeah. So it worked enough for me that I... Actually, the cold cap company has like approached me as being like a spokesperson or something for them because they Aww. consider this very good results, even though I lost a lot of hair. Yeah. I mean, when I saw you in person, I was amazed at your hair and everything. I was not expecting that, like in a positive way. <laughs> You're welcome. So David, your husband, do you feel like you guys got the support you needed during this journey or was there anything that you feel comfortable sharing that you per se, didn't have the support. Just as an example, my dad said that they lost a few friends because people just didn't know what to say to them during this. So do you guys feel like you had the support you needed or is there something that you wish went a little differently? I definitely had like way more support than I could have Aww. dreamt of. Good. For better or for worse, a lot of that was probably because I'm very young and it was unexpected, um, which I guess your mom was in that same situation. So I don't know, but uh, kind of like, unfortunately, like somebody younger has more people at their funeral than somebody who's mm-hmm. older. It's, it's just, I think 
yeah. you know, people are like, that's not fair, even though it's not fair, no matter how old you are. But yeah. I think my story kind of made people uh, empathetic, you know, like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, two little kids, what are you going to do? So we actually, um, my husband and uh, my two sons all have celiac disease. So we can't like accept homemade meals and stuff because like we have a completely gluten-free kitchen. That's <laughs> another thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not that point, one, another like, one of our things. Just a little thing that we're doing. So, um, so that means like we can't have any gluten at all, you know? So we didn't have, people wanted to bring us dinner, but they couldn't. And so mm-hmm. I just started telling people when they would ask if they could bring us dinner, I would, I felt so guilty being like, sorry, no, because I know they wanted to help. But then I started being like, well, I mean, we can order from certain restaurants. Like if you want to give us gift cards, like mm-hmm. DoorDash or something like that. So we were flooded with gift cards for grocery stores and restaurants and things like that. And I'm part of a church that was very just there for me. Um, and my mom came up every time I had a surgery and for every chemo treatment, uh, which is amazing. Like, I don't know what we would have done if my mom was. Yeah. I have no idea what our life would have been like because she just made our whole life work. She had the ability to just pack up and come up here many yeah. times. I, I don't know how many times she's been up here, but our support was awesome. I, I don't think I lost any friends. If anything, I think people I hadn't talked to in a long time were reaching out. And like, mm-hmm. making sure I was okay. That's so great to hear. So with that being said, do you have any tips for support that our listeners could use to help if they know somebody who is going through a similar situation? So, and feel free to share anything that wasn't very helpful. Um, I know a lot of times, like with Janelle and I, with grief, we have people reach out and say, what should I send? What should I say? And people are always looking for those little tips. So can you give some tips of support? I think reaching out is the big one. Like even just a text, like, Hey, how's it going? Cause I know some people were texting me, like, I know you're probably getting flooded with text messages, but I'm just doing this anyway. And like some days I was, and some days I wasn't. So I think even if you kind of lost touch with somebody or you're not as close as you used to be, and you know, they're going through this, I think letting them know that you're thinking about them is not, I thought it was nice. Um, yeah. And the gift cards, the delivery services, I found incredibly helpful because I wasn't limited to like a specific restaurant and I could just, and it delivered to my house. So that was like a really practical thing that now I do for everybody in every circumstance. Like you lost somebody, you lost your job, whatever, anything, you had a hard day. I'm like, here's a DoorDash gift card because it's so, I realize now how very helpful it is to just be able to have food delivered to you and you can make that decision at that moment with what you're, especially with like little kids. You know, like, oh, mm-hmm. we need chicken nuggets. Like, I, whatever. <laughs> we need um, chicken nuggets today. Yes. <laughs> yes, I totally. No, I, Jenna and I have said the same thing in our grief episodes where you, when you're in the deepest grief of your life or the deepest scary medical thing of your life, you don't know what you're going to be able to eat or in the mood to eat from day to day. So you necess- you don't necessarily want to eat someone's pasta primavera with this, this, and this on a night when you've just had the worst day of your life and you just want to shove some nuggets and fries at your kids and call it good. So Jenna and I are very mm-hmm. pro uh, meal delivery and uh, restaurant gift card. That was like the most practical thing that a lot of people got us and we used every single dollar like because they go fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, a family before, like, and my mom, the really five, and your people, mom. Like, it went, you know, the, the money we used it all. And I think a lot of people got me gifts. And that was really, really, really sweet. I got a lot of very practical gifts. And I felt very seen. And even some of them I didn't even end up using. But I could tell like somebody went on Google or talked to somebody who had had chemo and was like, what should I get somebody and I got a lot Ooh. of things that I didn't even so much to learn. I'd be like, Oh, what is this thing? And then <laughs> I would read like, Oh, it turns out this is really good for chemo. And I was like, Oh, great. You know, like, oh, that's so nice whatever somebody gave me like a huge pack of toothbrushes and I was like what (laughs) and then I googled it and I was like oh I didn't even know because there's so much to learn it's very similar to like when you get pregnant and you're like oh apparently like my whole life has to be different now kind of like that where you're like oh you're supposed to change your toothbrushes like every two weeks with chemo because of all the toxins and stuff what a thoughtful effing gift I love that so much um is there anything that you found not helpful and feel free to say no. I was just wondering. Feel free to say no. And then Jenna will tell you a long list of things she found not helpful. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I'll tell you. I, <laughs> do I want to get, so <laughs> I thought about at one point compiling like a list of awful things people said to me um, yes. when they found yes. out that I had cancer, but never in a mean way. But 
sometimes I was floored. Like, I know I have put my foot in my mouth so many times that like, I tried hard not to be too judgy, but there was just a couple of <laughs> things that I was like, one thing I will say is what's really not helpful is to try to make like if, if I were telling Janelle, like, hey, I just got this diagnosis, you know, if your first response is like bringing it back to you somehow, it feels very much like, I don't know, dismissive, I guess. Um, so don't say like, oh, my grandma had that cancer and she's fine, so you'll be fine. That's, that's, that's even like not a terrible one because that feels encouraging. But just like, well, so example, one woman that I said this to, she was like, oh, my God, it just makes me think when is it going to be my turn? Like, because everyone I know is getting it. And I was what? like, and she started crying, but I felt like she was crying for herself, which mm-hmm. is fine. Oh I, was response to have, but I was just so bamboozled. Like, what do I, do I comfort you now? Like, am I yeah. comforting you non-cancer with my, <laughs> with my yeah. diagnosis? Yeah. That's... yeah. Or yeah. just saying how much it freaks you out that, so yeah. I think it would just be kind of like making sure that the conversation at that moment, even for like the next two minutes, is more centered mm-hmm. around the person dealing with the issue. Or saying like horror stories of like, mm. oh, yeah, my girlfriend, everybody, yeah, because there's there are, in fact, my plastic surgeon kind of described it as an epidemic. Like there are a lot of young women getting diagnosed with breast cancer right now. Yeah. For many reasons, it could just be we're finding it sooner. And that's mm-hmm. why for the other reasons. But a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, this person and this person, this person, like everybody I know. That was a common response, which is fine. But then to tell me like something awful that happened with them is kind of not cool. It happens a lot with pregnant women, too, actually. So there's a lot of commonality now that I'm thinking yeah, about it. Yeah, I suppose. You're oh, right. Oh, God. Well, this horror story, you know, I mean, I'm like, well, thanks. That's not helpful. Yeah. But mostly what people said wasn't helpful. I don't know that anybody like went out of their way to do something for me. That was unhelpful. So. And you're such a positive person that I think you would see the true intention behind people's actions versus some people are like, Oh, I, you know, bitter. I don't need that right now. Um, you've always just been such a positive person. And that's something I've admired about you as well as if you don't know Jacqueline personally, first of all, you're missing out. Second of all, <laughs> she's a very godly woman and has a very strong faith, which I'm sure helped you through some of this, but I'm sure there were also times where you did struggle. And so do you have some words of encouragement for what got you through those really tough days? Uh, well, yes, I have words. I don't have. <laughs> um, I don't think my faith was really challenged in this. I've had my faith challenged. So I grew up a Christian, like I grew up going to church and I never really had like a falling out period with God at any point really. So, but in the last 36 years, I've, I've done a lot of grappling already. And so I don't think you need to have a diagnosis or, or something, a tragedy of some kind to, to start grappling with your faith. You know what I mean? It can be anything. Mm-hmm. You can just be like reading through the Old Testament and be like, oh, hold up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I guess the idea that the idea that, you know, God is happy with you and that God loves you, you know that because your life is really good at the moment. There's like a kind of a vibe that some like prosperity preaching kind of a, there's like some circles of Christianity that kind of can lead people to believe, you know, if something bad is happening to you, like maybe it's kind of your fault, sowing and reaping kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you make all the right choices and you have a good heart, then God's going to bless you and nothing bad will happen to you. Like I just started that many, many, many years ago. And so yes. I just, diagnosis did not shake my faith so I don't think that it was faith-wise like a difficult journey in that way I think in the thing that was difficult was just my lack my complete apathy towards anything honestly I felt like I was kind of getting a little bit further away from God if nothing else because I couldn't think thoughts or like was too tired to really get into my Bible that day or I wasn't going to church because you know I had to sort of be in seclusion yeah Mm -hmm thing going on it felt very practical it wasn't like I I was struggling to believe that God loved me anymore um Mm -hmm. if anything I feel like it got me into an even more intimate place with God in some ways because I could really look at some like dark places and and think thoughts like what if I don't make it in like the really scary time and I still found myself feeling grateful as a predominant feeling like fear and feeling grateful that like I have a I don't know I, I I have an amazing support group. I have like so many people checking on me. I've got kids that are amazing. I've got a husband who's like just there with me through this whole thing. My mom is here. Like 
if any, if you had to line up a situation where like, you know, you have to go through chemo at some point, like you pick when it is, it would not be with small kids. But other than that, like pretty much everything else like lined up. I mean, you know, I work from home. I'm a photographer. I choose my own hours. My husband works from home. He was there with me through a lot of this. So I, that was a long answer to your question, but I don't really feel like I grappled with my faith a lot the mm-hmm. here now because I did a lot of that in my 20s and I feel like at this point I kind of feel like I know who Jesus is and I'm not just didn't shake me yeah that's wonderful to hear um, that was really beautifully put too because it's interesting to hear the trajectory mm-hmm. of it like you've already done your wrestling with your faith and so now it was mm-hmm. just kind of succumbing to if this does go wrong all these things I'm grateful for and you feel confident in what the next steps are your grappling was already out of the way and so this was just kind of a lean-in situation which I thought it was interesting to hear slowly hear you come through kind of the entirety of your journey with cancer and before I always find that interesting to hear because some people maybe pulled out back a little bit I have pulled back in some of my grief and some people lean in and I always find it interesting to find which way people go into their religion and their times of trial Mm -hmm. so with that um like you mentioned there are a large percentage of women i feel like everyone knows someone personally or knows someone who knows someone who has had a breast cancer diagnosis do you have any words of encouragement or anything you would like to say to anyone who has recently been diagnosed i know you mentioned you had that great support team but i don't feel like everyone does and some women could be very lost in this well, that would be my like big tip if somebody is listening who has that diagnosis, my or any kind of diagnosis, my first step is like go find other people who also do. And it's so mm-hmm. easy with the internet. <laughs> I mean yeah. like yeah. like just type it into Facebook somewhere. Like I found Facebook to be a very helpful support group. I might I already see a therapist. <laughs> Um, which was actually really nice to have already had that in place. I can imagine it's it would be very daunting to try to find one in this yes. mm-hmm. season when you're already going to a million doctors and you're already interviewing a bunch of people. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work and I wouldn't put that on somebody, but if it's kind of nagging in the back of your head, like I've kind of been meaning to get a therapist for a while now and this feels like a good enough reason to do it, I would say yes, follow that mm-hmm. instinct. And I, my therapist suggested possibly a, a support group. Um, and I found that I actually really like a Facebook support group more than a, like a Zoom meeting kind of a thing, which are kind of the okay. only options for me right now. But like maybe even in a few months, maybe in-person stuff is going to be even more acceptable for people with cancer. But the Facebook one is nice because I could ask a question like to the universe and then get. 60 responses from people who are actually doing it right now, but like in my own time and I can kind of like search for questions and and it felt like more on my own schedule as opposed to just like Monday nights, eight o'clock, we're doing this. We're going to listen to people. It was nice to kind of like read, read stories as I felt ready for them. Um, yeah. and skip over things that I felt like I wasn't ready for. So my advice is to get a support group. And my other advice, this is something that I did not know until I had it happen to me. But when I got that sentinel node biopsy I needed physical therapy after that I actually lost a lot of my range of motion in my left arm because what they have to do is like move nerves over to like get to the lymph node Mm -hmm. and my arm was basically totally numb and I couldn't lift it like above my shoulder and you're supposed to be doing these arm exercises to like keep your range of motion and I couldn't do them and so I went to a physical therapist who specializes in like this is all she does is like people with breast cancer in Richmond that somebody can have a full-time job doing that. So oh, wow. but nobody told me that was a normal thing that you would need physical therapy. But after a sentinel node biopsy or a mastectomy, it's super common to go to physical therapy, but nobody told me about it. So I was afraid like my arm was like falling off and I would never use it again. I was just out. So find like an oncologist physical therapist before your surgery, because mm. chances are very, very, very good that you will need it. And that way, if you start feeling things, you can immediately, you know who you're going to call. Oh my God. I love that tip so much because even just thinking about, we've been talking about everyone knows someone and how prevalent it is with women, especially all of us that are edging me, not Jenna, edging towards (laughs) our forties. I would have never thought of that. And that's probably something that you want to set up before your surgery because those people will probably be booked up. And it's kind of like not to compare. Let's talk about me. But like, I have a history of 
anxiety and depression. So I started, I booked my first postpartum therapy appointment for one week after I had my baby because there was the chance of me having postpartum depression was so high. So assume that you're going to need an oncologist PT. Am I saying oncologist, right? I hope I am. And assume you're going to need that and make that appointment and you can always cancel the appointment if you don't need it. Cause that's something I never in a million years would have thought about. So you're giving somebody, some people a real action step for something that is really going to make a difference. Yeah. If you don't have anybody, you can like find me. <laughs> and I would Aww. love to talk to you too. Yeah, we'll link because... up we'll link up Jacqueline's information so you can message her if you're if you have no I can't imagine this battle if you have no one. Like there's someone some and that's what this whole podcast is about, which we say all the time. Our goal in this podcast is that every episode helps one woman feel less alone. So mm-hmm. If this podcast is hitting you and you are dead alone in this, Jacqueline will will link up Jacqueline and you and you no one no woman should go through something like this alone that's unimaginable. Yeah. So that really ties into my next question, which you kind of already answered. Um it's basically what's next in your journey. Do you feel called to do anything with your journey such as outreach work or connecting with other women, I was actually going to ask you if you would be willing to do that. Because personally, like I know a few friends of friends who have been diagnosed with cancer. And it's one of those things where I feel like people either really feel called to help others, or it can be very triggering for them. So what do you see yourself next in this journey? Definitely like helping people for sure. I made friends at the infusion center. So I already Aww. have like kind of a group of women that I check in on who are still Aww. getting treatment. And um, I actually have a, I wouldn't even say friend, a person that I knew a few years ago who is a couple years older than me. He recently got diagnosed and is going to chemo right now that we text like every day now, which yeah. um, I'm really into. I feel like it's something positive that can come from this. And I have this like seed that has been planted in my spirit, in my heart. I really want to do, I'm a photographer and I have this vision for doing like boudoir photos for women who have had um, mastectomies mm-hmm. or, I love or some kind of, there's a real lack of sexiness in my life right now mm-hmm. <laughs> that I would like to pick back up in some way. And I know a lot of other women feel the same way. There's a lot of mm-hmm. like logical reasons and physical reasons and stuff like that. And I think, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but it's a, it's a plan once I kind of settle in to kind of figure out how yeah. to to make that happen I think that's so beautiful I follow a couple of Instagram accounts of just like I'm very body positivity right now and there are accounts of just women with mastectomy or men and the scars and they're unaltered but there is I haven't seen anything that brings back the sexiness to a woman's life that might be missing that or a man's life that might be missing that. So I think that's Mm -hmm. a really interesting next step for you because you're a photographer and you're going to bring some beauty into it and give something back to some women that are feeling less sexy and break. I just, it's really beautiful. I love that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have one more question before Jenna closes out. So what happens now medically? How are you screened? Do you have any more surgeries? Do you have any more procedures? Do you have any more chemo? How do they monitor you? Um, so, uh, great question. I am in a situation where they can't really screen me for anything at this point. They took We did the full mastectomy, and what they found in my lymph nodes was so very small. They couldn't even tell me what kind of cancer it was. It was so small. Okay. You can't really do, like, tests or biopsies or scans or anything to know if there's something there or not. If there was a local recurrence like in my chest wall, at this point, I would just feel it because there's nothing else really there. So I would feel it. And I go back in to get follow up regularly, but not all the time. I would be like every six months or so for the first couple of years. And somebody's basically just going to look at me and just feel around and just go, okay, you feel good. So you're basically Um, at a pre-cancer person's level of monitoring. Maybe a little bit more. Like I'm just being more aware. I'm close to that though. I'm very close to that. So it would be also my oncologist was just telling me we look out for stuff that stands out. So his examples Mm. were you're playing tennis, you hurt your elbow, and then like six weeks later it's not healing, or I have a headache that I can't shift, they want to see me because that would those would be signs of like a distant recurrence. It's more like and at that point you already have it, but um Mm -hmm. there's no 
I kind of wish there was. And he even said, my oncologist even said, like, maybe in 10 years, that'll be different. Maybe they'll have, like, we're going to scan your body and we'll find any of the cancer cells. But right now, it's sort of just if something feels cool. off and kill somebody. How cool would that be? Just scan your body. Right. Well, thank you for sharing your, your journey with us. It's been very eye opening and beautiful in a way to hear how you've handled it. I know not everyone sees it that way, but I've just always admired how you've handled everything and been very open via technology, Facebook, everything. You don't have that filter of this is my personal life. Like I can tell that you have that gift and that want to help others in this journey. And I think that the authenticity of your posts is very legitimate and makes people feel I would have, there's no one else. I, that would share was she would share what you were sharing that I would feel comfortable reaching out to and saying, we have questions. Can you come on and help us make someone else feel less alone? Because your sharing mm-hmm. was so authentic and it was so from the heart and your uncertainty was so present and your vulnerability was so there that it just, it really resonated with a lot of people, I think. And That's not to say like, yay for Jacqueline and her cancer. It's Mm -hmm. to say like, thank you for giving all of us a gift of the ability to have someone in our lives that we know personally. Every one of us has you that's a gift in our life that we know personally. And now all of the listeners that was able to be very vulnerable and open with a lot of the questions. Like, I didn't even know what chemo was. Like, Mm -hmm. we should all know this. And you are giving us that gift of having the open conversation about these things that hopefully will help someone give themselves a breast exam up to their shoulder instead of just around their areola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to note that Jacqueline also fought when she thought something wasn't right. It wasn't just like, yes. okay, let's end there. That was my, I forgot. That was my like tip to people. I meant, I wrote this. Jacqueline's closing thought on how to advocate for yourself. We love a good advocate for yourself on this. So tell us exactly how to advocate for ourselves. I was so glad that my breast surgeon advocated for me because I am such a people pleaser and such a go with the flow person. You are a go with the flow. I wouldn't want to like bother my doctor. I don't want to be a bother, but. No, I did it for my kid because it was really hard for him to get Mm -hmm. a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so once I had to go through that, which took literally years to to figure out, um, now I'm like, oh, if you have inconclusive results, you keep pushing, like you keep going. And maybe it comes from a place of privilege because sometimes that means that your insurance won't cover things. And I totally understand that. And I'm really blessed that I felt like I had the authority to, to say it. But if you are concerned, you feel something and you go in and get a mammogram and they say, yeah, we can't really see what's going on. It's probably nothing. I'm so glad that I didn't wait because from the time of the mammogram to the time of the mastectomy, like it had, it was so pervasive and all throughout that like, if I had waited another year, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I would have had, it would have been all over my whole body. Oh my so, God, yeah. Like, not to scare people, but just push. And just make mm-hmm. sure that you don't accept inconclusive. It's probably nothing like on anything for any diagnosis ever. Just keep going until you know one way or the other what's going on. And you did. You mm-hmm. fought so hard for your son's celiac diagnosis. And Jenna and I are privy to the story. And we don't like to talk about our kids' medical stuff on here. But you fought really hard for your son's diagnosis for years. So let's have our call to action be fight for ourselves as hard as we advocate for our kids. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you. And with that, thank you. Remember we love to you. call your therapist and take your meds and do a good breast exam up to your yeah. shoulder. Two, three, four.